Loving Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for your many blessings to us, for the privilege we have of coming together that we might study your word. I would ask that you would lead us, guide us, and direct us by your Holy Spirit. Send your Holy Spirit to lead us into the understanding of your word and open our hearts that we will be receptive to the messages from the book of Revelation that you have for us and help us to be open to your will for our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our topic tonight entitled Revelation's Messages for the Time of the End. I believe that we are living in the time of the end. To help us to understand the difference between the time of the end and the end of time, I'd like to share with you a story about my brother. My brother is nine years older than I, and when he was a teenager, I was quite young, but I do remember that one summer he got a job working for a turkey farmer. And since we had grown up on a small farm with, you know, horses and cows and chickens, those kinds of animals, in a little while my brother figured he knew everything there was to know about raising turkeys, so he bought from this turkey farmer 12 turkey chicks and brought them home and began to raise them. The problem was that he discovered they weren't as easy to raise as our chickens, and the turkey chicks began to die off one at a time, and when we got to the fall of the year, we only had two turkeys left. Now, when you get to the fall of the year and you have two turkeys, you know what that means, folks. What that means is one of them is going to be for your Thanksgiving dinner and the other one is going to be for Christmas dinner. And that was our plan, and the plan was going well until just before Thanksgiving, somebody stole one of the turkeys. Hmm. Now, when you just have one turkey left, what are you going to do with that one turkey? Well, we decided that we would watch it extra carefully and that we would feed it extra well to get it ready for Christmas dinner. What I want you to understand here is that that decision that day marked for the turkey the beginning of the time of the end. But the day came when my dad took that turkey and stretched its neck out over a chopping block and when he brought the hatchet down for the turkey that marked the end of time. So we know the difference between the time of the end and the end of time. The time of the end is that period of time which shortly precedes and leads up to the end of time. When we talk about the end of time for this world as we know it, that end of time is when Jesus Christ comes a second time. That will be the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is the end of time. The time of the end is that period of time which shortly precedes the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we will discover tonight that there are messages from the book of Revelation that need to be presented to the entire world to prepare us for the end of time. We'll notice those messages as we go to Revelation tonight, going to Revelation chapter 10, where we're in an interlude passage, an interlude in the vision of the seven trumpets. And the interlude passages we have learned are passages that have messages directed to those who live during the time of the end. So this is a time of the end passage in Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. It says, And I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. Now, here's a mighty angel coming down, clothed with a cloud. The term angel, as we find it here in the Bible, from the original Greek, this term can be rightly translated either angel or messenger. And so what we have is a heavenly messenger that has come down. Notice that he's clothed with a cloud. Notice the rest of the description of this angel. It says, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. Now, when we find the rainbow on his head, his face like the sun, feet like pillars of fire, what we discover is that this is the same description that is given of Jesus back in Revelation chapter 1 where he is pictured standing among the seven candlesticks. So this heavenly messenger probably is none other than Jesus Christ himself standing there and notice what he has in his hand. Verse 2 says, and he had a little book open in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Now with his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land, this is probably indicating his authority over both. 
but he has in his hand a little book open. Now, the original language carries the meaning of a little book having been opened. It's like it was sealed up before, closed before, but now suddenly it's open in the hand of the heavenly messenger. And so here is the heavenly messenger, none other than Jesus Christ himself, with a book open, having been opened in his hand. Now, what book could that be that is open in the hand of this heavenly messenger well, it's interesting, if we're going to find that book, we probably ought to go to God's Word to find that book. What do you think? And actually, as we look for a book, we need to look for a book that perhaps has been sealed before, and we can ask the question, is there any book in the Bible which once was sealed? Is there any book that was ever sealed before that now would be open in the hand of the heavenly messenger? Actually, there's only one book of the Bible where the writer of that book was told to seal that book to shut it up. It's the book of Daniel. It's the little book open. It's the book of Daniel in the hand of the heavenly messenger. Notice in Daniel 12, verse 4, it says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until when, folks? Until the time of the end. So it wouldn't be sealed forever. And here's a clue as to when we get to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And so we discover that the book of Daniel was to be sealed up, but not sealed forever only until the time of the end you can know when you get there because many would run to and fro and knowledge would be increased now as we look at that we can tell that we are certainly in the time of the end by now aren't we folks with knowledge increasing ever rapidly around us and people running to and fro in the earth now but we're going to go back to the beginning of the time of the end and understand when this time of the end began and actually the knowledge increasing here, it's talking more about the knowledge of the prophecies of the book of Daniel than it is about anything else. Let's come back to our passage in Daniel chapter 12 and notice a time reference here. In Daniel 12, verse 7, Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. Now notice, he held up his right hand and he held up his left hand toward heaven and he swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a period of time, for a time, times, and half a time. Now we're familiar with that time period. That's the three and a half times or the 1260 years that we studied about even on our second night together in this series of presentations. That 1260 year period we discovered would stretch from the year 538 to the year 1798. And so here's a reference to that period of time that ended in 1798. Going on to the next verse, in verse 8, it says, Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the what, folks? Till the time of the end. So let's notice there's reference in verse 9 to the time of the end. There's reference in verse 4 to the time of the end. And in between, there's reference to that 1260-year period that ended in the year 1798. So the inference is quite plain that when you get to the year 1798, to the end of the time, times, and half a time, that we have gotten to the time that the Bible refers to as the time of the end. So when it says it's sealed until the time of the end, it's really sealed until the end of the 1260 years or sealed until the year 1798. And this is the time when worldwide travel actually started in this world when people began to traverse the oceans as knowledge was also beginning to increase in a general way but specifically in regard to the prophecies of the book of Daniel and the prophecies of the Bible. Actually, as you come to the end of the 1700s and into the beginning of the 1800s, it's interesting to see that there is a great religious revival going across the world. We see also that there is an advent awakening. By that I mean that there is a renewed interest in the second coming of Jesus Christ as a literal event, that he will literally return. And all of this is coming 
At the end of the 1700s, at the beginning of the 1800s, in response to the book of Daniel having been opened and a renewed interest in the prophecies of the Bible. Back in Revelation 10, verse 2, let's read it again. And he had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars, and when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now tonight I'm not going to share with you what the seven thunders uttered. And you'll see why I'm not going to do that as we read the next verse notice verse 4 now when the seven thunders uttered their voices I was about to write but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them so now you know why I'm not going to share with you what the seven thunders uttered right I have no idea and nobody does and one day I though I want to ask the Lord what it was the seven thunders uttered I do want to make a point here though and the point is this sometimes people will say that the book of Revelation is a closed book that no one can understand and so there's no sense studying it now we know that that isn't true because in Revelation 1 verse 3 we're told that we will have a blessing if we will read it hear it and keep it the prophecy of that book you see the book of Revelation and so there is a blessing to be had from it. The book of Revelation never was a sealed book. Oh, there was something that John was told to seal. It was what the seven thunders uttered, but he didn't even write it down, so it's not even part of the book of Revelation, you see. So none of the book of Revelation actually was sealed. Only the book of Daniel was sealed, and only sealed for a time up until the beginning of the time of the end. Verse 5 says... And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever. Notice how similar this is to what we read in the book of Daniel where he raised up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever. Now what was it that he swore? Notice, swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer, or as the King James Version says it, that there should be time no longer. And so, truly, there would be delay or time no longer. As we enter into the time of the end, there were those that as they began to study the prophecy prophecies of the book of Daniel they began to come to the understanding that, that time would give place to eternity and that the Lord would no longer delay his coming but Jesus would return and have a literal return and that his return would be very soon in fact many as they began to study the prophecies of the book of Daniel came to an understanding that they expected Jesus to come within the early 1800s and so this was part of the message that was being understood from the prophecies of the book of Daniel at that time and an emphasis upon the second coming of Jesus Christ with a delay no longer in Revelation 10 verse 7 it says but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel when he is about to sound the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets so it's in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel what's the seventh angel all about well it's the sounding of the seventh trumpet there were seven angels with seven trumpets and we're in that interlude between the sounding of the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet so in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet that means the sixth trumpet has already sounded but it says when he is about to sound the seventh trumpet has not yet sounded oh let me help you to understand when the seventh trumpet sounds that will coincide with the second coming of Jesus Christ or the end of time here we are living in the days of the seventh angel shortly before he's about to sound so we're living during the time of the end but during the time of the end something needs to be accomplished what is it notice again it says the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets so he's already told his prophets about this that the mystery of God must be finished so let's add that to our list as they declared that there would be de delay no longer that the mystery of God must be finished before the end of time can come what's this mystery of God in Ephesians 6 verse 19 it says 
Paul is asking that we pray for him and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the mystery of God. Notice it here in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. It says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory and the good news is he's coming back for you and me and so that's the mystery of godliness how it was that the one who lived throughout eternity could come and take his place as man and die and live again and he's coming back for you and me the mystery of God is all about the gospel of Jesus Christ now remember he said as he declared to his servants the prophets Jesus had revealed this himself in Matthew chapter 24 verse 14 saying and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come so Jesus said that the preaching of the gospel to all of the world would bring us to the end of time oh the book of Revelation reveals that the mystery of God being completed will bring us to the end of time the sounding of the seventh trumpet so during the time of the end that shortly precedes the end of time the mystery of God must be finished the gospel message being completed going out throughout all of the world back to Revelation 10 verse 8 then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth notice what happened when he did verse 9 and I went to the angel and said to him give me the little book and he said to me take and eat it and it will make your stomach bitter but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth now that's an interesting concept isn't it when he says give me the little book this heavenly messenger says to John he says take it and eat it now this is obviously symbolic language isn't it and what this is is a symbolic language that reveals the experience that those who began to study this little book open in the hand of the angel that they studied the book of Daniel it begins to depict the experience that they had oh when he said take and eat it he said it will make your stomach bitter but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth now when you eat something where does it go first does it go to your mouth or to your stomach well it always goes to your mouth first so it tells us that their first experience in studying the book of Daniel would be very sweet but before their experience would be over they would have a bitter experience that's what we find here in this particular passage of scripture now I want you to notice that yes when the mystery of God would be finished as they were declaring that there would be delay no longer before it would be over there would be a first sweet and then a bitter experience by God's people well let's come back and let's begin to talk about the book of Daniel being opened and an understanding of the prophecies of Daniel and this knowledge was being increased around the world it wasn't in just one localized area in fact there were very various scholars of the Bible who as they began to study the prophecies of the book of Daniel they began to come to an understanding that Jesus Christ was going to return a literal return of Jesus and that it was going to be very soon in fact most of these individuals predicted that Jesus would come in the early 1800s let me tell you about some of them one of those was a man by the name of Charles Irving who lived in England he was a minister of the Church of England and he began to preach that Jesus would have a literal return and he was joined by many others we know of about 400 others of the Church of England throughout England that joined him in proclaiming that there would be a literal return of Jesus Christ in the Middle East there was a converted Jew by the name of Joseph Wolf who also began to proclaim a second coming of Jesus Christ from the study of the prophecies of the Bible in fact I've mentioned him before he was the missionary to the world and he actually preached to the Congress of the United States of America on the second coming of Jesus Christ in South America a man by the name of Manuel de la Cunza also a Roman Catholic priest 
who preached on the second coming of Jesus Christ, recognizing that his second coming would be a literal coming. Here in North America, there was a man by the name of William Miller who, through his study of the prophecies of the book of Daniel, came to the conviction that Jesus not only would have a literal return, but that his return was very near and that his return would be by the mid-1800s. I'm going to share with you his story. Now, before I do, let me just mention that there were these various ones studying these passages of the Bible back in the early 1800s at the close of the 1700s and all of them were doing this without collaboration you know they didn't have internet or telephone or telegraph or any of those things back in those times you see and so without collaboration all at the same time as the book of Daniel is being opened and the knowledge of that book is being opened there is a renewed interest in the prophecies of the Bible and a preaching about the second coming of Jesus Christ that was taking place around the world and there were many who were coming to similar conclusions all at the same time without collaboration now William Miller let me share with you his story here in North America William Miller grew up in upper New York State and uh, he grew up in a Baptist home his mother always wanted to take him to church and along the way he came up with that understanding of the Bible but as he entered early adulthood he kind of gave up his Baptist beliefs and he became a deist a deist is one who believes that God created the world but that when he created the world he also created certain natural laws of cause and effect and kind of leaves the world to run on its own a deist doesn't believe that God would intervene in history. A deist would not believe in the miracles of the Bible, but would think that there was always some sort of natural explanation or would scoff at the idea outright, thinking that there are contradictions in the Bible. So this was William Miller's background. However, he was an educated man. He was a student of history. He was a recognized leader. In fact, he served as a captain in the War of 1812. And at the close of the War of 1812, he went back to his farm in Upper New York State. Now there, as he went back home, his mother, as mothers will do, tried to encourage him to come to church on Sundays and so he would come to church every once in a while out of respect for his mother or out of respect for his uncle you know in those days they didn't have a preacher for every church and so they had these what you call circuit riding preachers that would go around preaching from place to place and when the preacher would not be present what they would do is they would have the sermons printed up and sent to the churches and the various deacons of the various churches would read those sermons and when William Miller would come uh, at the time that his uncle was to read the sermon out of respect for his uncle but he'd come some other times as well and he would complain often about the quality of the reading of the sermons and he'd say you know they need to get somebody who's better at reading the sermons because they're not being read well at all and it's really kind of boring you know something folks you need to be real careful about what you complain about isn't that right and so sure enough guess who they asked to read the sermons they asked William Miller to read the sermons and so he began to do that and over time as he began to read the sermons you know what the word of God when you read it actually has an impact in your life and so as he was reading these sermons he was torn wondering what he needed to do because he's reading these sermons about these facts of God's word and reading these things from the Bible and he's in a quandary as to what to do he says I've got to either give up my deist beliefs and uh, recognize that these things are truth or I've got to quit preaching these things and reading these sermons because it was causing him all kinds of problems so he decided what he would do is he would get out his Bible and see if he could work out the seeming inconsistencies that he saw in Scripture. And so what he did is he took his Bible and he took one study aid. The only study aid he had was a Cruden's Concordance. And if you're going to study the Bible, the best thing to have is a Bible and a concordance. So he started in the book of Genesis and he began his study of the Bible. And he began reading 
starting in Genesis and as he read through the Bible every time he came to a passage that he didn't understand or that he thought maybe there was some inconsistency what he did is he got out his concordance and he looked up other Bible passages that talked about the same thing and he checked all of the cross references and as he checked them once he found his answer and everything was satisfactory in his mind then he'd go back to his study and he progressed this way through the Bible till he got to a passage in the book of Daniel that would forever change his life the passage that he got to was in Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 where it says and he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now we've studied this passage before, and we've noted that this passage has two elements to it. First of all, there's the element of the time period of the 2,300 days. Secondly, there's the element of the event with the sanctuary being cleansed. And so William Miller came to this Bible verse and he began to deal with these two elements of the verse. Let's talk about the possibilities that we have for these two elements just for a moment. With two elements to the verse, here are the four possibilities. First of all, it's possible to be correct about both of the elements. Likewise, it's possible to be incorrect about both of the elements. But also, it is possible to be right about the time and wrong about the event or wrong about the time but correct about the event. All of those are our possibilities with this particular Bible verse. Now William Miller as he studied it out being a student of history as he looked at the time element he studied that time element and noted the connection between the 2300 days here this 2300 year period he used that day for a year principle that we have used notice the connection between this period and the 490 years of Daniel chapter 9 he saw that they both have the beginning point in 457 BC and the first 490 years would end in 34 AD but since we've only dealt with 490 of the original 2300 there's another 1810 years left over when you add 1810 to the year 34 AD you come to the year 1844 and so he traced out this time period as he traced the time period William Miller first came to an understanding that this time period would end sometime between the spring of 1843 and the spring of 1844 now having covered the time period he spent some time dealing with the event although the event was the cleansing of the sanctuary and what William Miller did here is he just kind of accepted a concept that was prevalent in his day without really researching it and the concept was that the sanctuary simply was symbolic for planet earth so having accepted that concept which really was a mistake asking what is the sanctuary he said well the sanctuary is the earth here he made a mistake so he asked the question how will the earth be cleansed and rightly answered that the earth will be cleansed by fire and then when he asked when will it be cleansed he also rightly answered only after the second coming of Jesus Christ and then when he focused upon the event he asked what event is predicted and concluded that it must be predicting Christ's coming in the year 1844 which was obviously a mistake because of his first mistake at the beginning of thinking about what the sanctuary represented now we know that Jesus didn't come in 1844 don't we and so he was mistaken regarding these things however William Miller continued his study he came to this conclusion in the year 1818 and because he was afraid that maybe he had made some mistake in his calculations he went on and he continued his study for a number of years for five more years he studied in fact when you are on a farm in upper New York state back in the early 1800s and the year was 1818 when he first came to this conclusion you have a lot of time to study 
he would study at night. He'd get out his Bible and his concordance and he'd study God's word and he'd look back through history and he traced that time period. He developed charts on the time period and, and checked all of that out. He was being very careful. He didn't share what he had discovered with anybody for a five-year period of time. And over these five years from 1818 to the year 1823, he continued to study these things before he first shared it with some of his friends that he had discovered these things from the book of Daniel and that he expected Jesus to return sometime between the spring of the year 1843 and the spring of the year 1844. Now, to his surprise, his friends were very eager to hear what he had to say. And they were excited about the prospect of Jesus returning in the year 1843. You can imagine that, can't you? And so many of them would encourage him and say, William, you need to share this with others. You need to go to churches and preach this. But after all, he wasn't a preacher, and so he was reluctant to do that. But through the years, his friends would encourage him to do that, and he always felt this voice in the back of his mind encouraging him, saying, William, what are you doing to get this out to the world? And he'd always kind of just push that voice to the back of his mind now he continued his study through the years and in the year of 1831 on a Saturday morning he was sitting in his kitchen in his farmhouse there in upper New York State and as he sat in his farmhouse that Saturday morning he was sitting there studying his Bible once again and while he was studying he had that urge come upon him, that uh, voice that was speaking in his conscience that was saying, William, what are you doing to tell this to the world? And it came upon him so strong that he felt like he had to get down on his knees. So he got down on his knees in the kitchen and he prayed a prayer to the Lord and he said, okay, Lord, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you want me to tell this to the world, I'll go and I'll preach this in churches, but I'll only go to churches to share this where they first of all give me an invitation to go. And he got back up, sat back down at his kitchen table pretty satisfied because after all, nobody had ever asked him to do this before. And so he sat down satisfied with the whole thing. However, within about 30 minutes, there came a knock at his door. And when he went to the door to answer, to see who was there at the door, lo and behold, he discovered his nephew, who that morning had traveled 15 miles to be there. Now, back in 1831, you didn't travel 15 miles in 30 minutes, did you folks? No. And there was his nephew standing at the door, and he said, well, why are you here? And the nephew said, well, father has sent me because our pastor is sick. And our pastor was supposed to preach to us tomorrow, but he can't preach, so father sent me to ask you if you would come and share with our church tomorrow what you have been studying about the second coming of Jesus Christ. So William Miller you know, wasn't real excited about that. Actually, he went out into a grove of trees where he had to talk with the Lord for a period of time. Uh, but, you know, as a deist, he had always been true to his word. So as a Christian, he could do no other. So he went with his nephew. That next day, he went to the church. He sat down at the table. He spread out his Bible and his concordance and his, uh, his charts that he had developed. And he just began to share with the people from the Bible what he had been studying from the prophecies of the Bible about the second coming of Jesus and his expectation to see Jesus return sometime between the spring of 1843 and the spring of 1844. Now, to his surprise, people were excited to hear what he had to say. In fact, they came back back later in the day and he shared more in fact he stayed through the week and they came back every day throughout that week as he shared with them from the bible finally at the end of the week he went back home when he got home he discovered waiting for him a letter from a pastor of a baptist church nearby and that pastor had sent him a letter inviting him to come to share with his congregation the things that he had been studying about the second coming of Jesus now folks this pastor hadn't even heard that he had gone to the first church you see to share about the second coming of Jesus Christ but it just goes to show that when you make an agreement with the Lord the Lord will he'll hold you to it what do you think 
And so he began to go to various places. Along the way, as he would go from church to church and proclaim about the second coming of Jesus Christ, he would go to various churches, Baptists, Methodists, Congregationalists, all kinds of different places. And when he began preaching in 1831, that Jesus would come about the year 1843, you can imagine that a lot of people got kind of excited about that. What do you think? And the reason why so many different churches invited him to come is because of the great revivals that would take place as he would come to preach on the second coming of Jesus Christ. As many individuals would come and uh, be baptized and join the churches. Um, William Miller was joined by others in proclaiming this. He was not the only one. In fact, we know of at least 175 other ministers of various denominations who joined him in proclaiming the second coming of Jesus Christ. These are individuals that we know of by name. There obviously were others beyond them, but these are the ones that we know of by name that joined him in preaching that Jesus Christ would return. One minister one day asked him, William Miller, do you really believe what you are proclaiming? And he said, yes, I really believe it. And he asked him, well, well, then what are you doing to get it out to all of the world? And he says, well, wherever they invite me to go, I go to preach. And he says, but you, mostly you're going to these small towns and villages. How about big cities like Boston or Philadelphia? How about those cities? Would you go there and preach? And he said, yes, if they invite me to come, I will go there. And so this man, Joshua Himes, actually became kind of his advance man and went out and got invitations for him to go to some of the larger cities as well. They actually purchased the largest tent that had ever been constructed to that time. It was larger than any existing circus tent. In fact, it was so big it took a number of men to go and set this up and to maintain this tent. And when they'd go into various towns and cities and put up the tent, people would come and lay wagers as to whether or not they thought they'd get enough people to fill it. And generally, they always did get enough people to fill it as well. Now, coming back to Revelation chapter 10, verse 9, let's talk about what we find here in this passage. It says, I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And in verse 10 it says, And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Now this is symbolic language as we have indicated before. But I don't know how better with symbolic language one could express the experience of the people back in William Miller's day. Now those who joined William Miller and began to proclaim about the second coming of Jesus Christ, they were at first known as Millerites. Later on, they became known as Adventists. As various people of various denominations began to join this movement, it was known as the Advent Awakening. They became known as Adventists because they were looking for the Advent or the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, William Miller was actually licensed as a minister of the Baptist Church. And like I said, many churches of various denominations were inviting him and others to come and preach about the second coming of Jesus Christ. But we know that Jesus did not come in the year 1843 or the year 1844. And when they got to the spring of the year 1844 and Jesus had not yet returned there were many who just kind of gave up faith in the whole thing. And they thought, well, there really was never anything to this. There were others who had been involved in the study of these Bible passages who were convinced that God had been leading them, but obviously they had something else that they needed to learn and so they began to meet together in fact throughout that summer of 1844 uh, they met at various camp meetings in various places over time and as they would meet at those camp meetings they would go over some of the things actually in August there was a camp meeting where 
One speaker was standing up going over some of the passages of the Bible that they had been studying when at the back of the tent there was a flurry of excitement as a gentleman rode up quickly on his horse in a cloud of dust he got off and there was a conversation at the back of the tent and one lady said brother snow has come and he has something new for us we've heard all of this before we need to hear what brother snow has to say so brother snow got up and he said this he said we were wrong to expect jesus to come in the spring of the year because the spring types were fulfilled at the first coming of jesus he said we should have expected jesus to return in the fall of the year because the fall types of the jewish system were to be fulfilled at the second coming of jesus christ in fact, he says, we should really expect to Jesus to come on the Jewish Day of Atonement this year. And everybody wanted to know, when will the Day of Atonement fall in the year 1844? And he said, well, according to the reckoning of the Kairite Jewish sect, they were the ones that were most careful in keeping the Jewish calendar. He said, according to their reckoning, the Day of Atonement this year falls on October 22. And so with renewed excitement, they looked forward to the coming of the Lord on October 22 of 1844. This was known as the Seventh Month Movement. It was known as the Seventh Month Movement because the Day of Atonement comes on the tenth day of the seventh month of the Jewish calendar year. And so those who had part of that were looking forward with great expectation. I want you to notice the wording here. It says, it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. I'd like for you to consider that indeed it was sweet in their mouth. How sweet was their anticipation of the Lord's return. But not only would it be sweet in the mouth, it would also be bitter in the stomach. And I'd like to suggest that when Jesus did not return, how bitter their disappointment must have been. In fact, in one home where there was a Methodist minister who had gone down to the river to baptize a large group of people in the fall of the year, shortly before October 22, he went down and he baptized a lot of people. He started back home from that baptism. And as he started back home, he was met by another group of people coming to be baptized. And he went back and baptized them, started back home. And then he was met by a third group of people coming to be baptized. He went back and baptized them before he finally went home. Uh, the result of all of this, because the water was so cold and the chill was in the air, was that this Methodist minister became very ill and he died just a few days before October 22. Now, he was the father of several children, and I can imagine in that home as they had the funeral service that the children might have asked their mother, Mother, are we going to see Father again? And she would probably give them comfort by saying, Sure, because Jesus is coming back in just a few days, and there's going to be a resurrection, and we're going to be rejoined with your Father. I'd like to suggest that it must have been a great disappointment for them when Jesus did not return on October 22, what do you think? But it was a great disappointment for many as well, for many besides them. And we'll talk something about that disappointment, but I want you to understand something, that this was not the first time that God's people have been disappointed concerning one of his comings. Oh yes, they were disappointed concerning the second coming of Jesus because he didn't come on October 22 of 1844. Sometimes people have said because those who were part of this Millerite movement or part of the Advent awakening that because Jesus did not come on October 22 of 1844 that God was not with them and that the things that they had learned from the scriptures were all wrong well i'd like for you to consider several points number one consider that there were two elements to the verse we'll come back to that in just a second but number two i want you to consider that this is not the first time that god's people have been disappointed actually there was a first disappointment concerning christ's first coming do you remember how Jesus had actually predicted and told his disciples that the time was at hand? In fact, Jesus had said that he must 
die, that he must be buried, and that he would rise again the third day. In fact, he told his disciples this more than once, that he would suffer, die, be buried, and rise again the third day. However, the disciples somehow miss all of that. It's kind of interesting when we see the story in Luke chapter 24, how Jesus comes and appears to two disciples who are walking along a road to Emmaus. Actually, these two disciples are very discouraged. And they're very disappointed over the fact that the one that they had followed had been crucified and had been buried. And as Jesus comes, he walks along with them. He withholds his identity from them. I think I know why. We'll see why here in just a moment. In Luke 24, verse 21, they are lamenting, saying to Jesus, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is what? The third day since these things happened. This is the first day of the week, and they're saying, look it, today is the third day since these things happened. And Jesus had actually told them that he would rise again the third day, but they don't even believe those that have seen him alive on that day. So how does Jesus deal with these as they're walking along the road to Emmaus? Does he say to them, well, you foolish fellows, I guess that since you didn't get it the first time, I guess I'm just going to have to give up on you guys altogether and go find somebody else who will believe what I have to say? No, he doesn't say that. I want you to notice what he does. He does say something about being foolish. Look at it in verse 25. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. You see, their problem was not that they did not believe the prophets. It's that they did not believe in all that the prophets had spoken. Oh, you see, what they had done is they were saying, we were hoping it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Actually, he did redeem Israel, but he redeemed Israel from their sins, not from Roman oppression. And what they were looking for is they were looking to be redeemed from Roman oppression, you see. And when they studied the prophecies of the Bible, it's like they had blinders on. As they studied the prophecies of the Bible, they focused upon those things that indicated that they would have a glorious kingdom without others ruling over them. Hmm. And they missed the prophecies that predicted the suffering Messiah to come. And so he says, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. So he has to help them understand all of those things. He said, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What Jesus did with those who were disappointed because they didn't believe in all that the prophets had spoken, because they had studied the Bible and the prophecies of the Bible with tunnel vision, so to speak. What he did with them is he took them back through Moses and all the prophets, and he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And as he took them back, he gave them instruction. Now, here's a point. I mentioned that Jesus didn't immediately reveal his identity to these two disciples. Have you ever wondered why when they said we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel, why Jesus didn't just say, well, look, here I am, I'm alive. Can't you see? Why didn't he do that? I have a feeling that if he would have done that and revealed himself to them, that they would have probably gotten so excited, they really wouldn't have listened to anything that he had to share with them from the Scriptures. But here's the point, folks. In their hour of disappointment... They recognize that they had a faulty understanding, so now they're open to learning a new understanding of God's Word. And so while Jesus withholds his identity, what he does is he goes back and he shows them all the things in the Scriptures concerning himself regarding how he needed to first come as a suffering Messiah for Israel. And as he went through all of that, he helped them to have a new understanding. I'd like to suggest that this is really what happens here also at the time of this great disappointment concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, here's an interesting point. 
we've discussed the possibilities that there were two elements to the verse that we looked at a time element and an event and that it's possible to be right about both wrong about both or right about one and wrong about the other now think about it the first disappointment concerning Christ's first coming we need to understand that there were two elements the time was at hand Jesus had proclaimed that the time was at hand so the disciples had the time right but you know what they were wrong about the event and you know what concerning the second coming of Jesus William Miller and those who followed him were also wrong about one of the events the two elements for 2,300 days then the sanctuary shall be cleansed there's that time element of the 2,300 days and the event of the sanctuary being cleansed what were they right about if anything well I mentioned after this disappointment that there were those who just gave up all faith in it but among those who had been studying the prophecies of the Bible they were convinced that God had been leading them and that God would continue to lead them among those there were those who said well we must have been wrong about the time and so what they did is they adjusted their ending time for that time period and set additional dates in the future for the coming of the Lord from that group has come a group that today is known as the Advent Christian Church but there were others who said well yes the time was right but we must have been wrong about the event and you know that's just like it was concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ that first disappointment they were right about the time wrong about the event and so among those people there were those who went back to say yeah we need a new understanding of the event and how did they get that understanding only in the time of disappointment actually they're in New England in various parts of New England there were those who gathered in various homes awaiting the Lord's return and as they awaited the Lord's return they waited all through the day on October 22 for his return only to be disappointed when they did not come they waited through until midnight and in one particular home out on a farm in the wee hours of the morning a group of men who had gathered together they left the house and they went out to what amounted to be nothing but a corn crib and they got out on their knees in a circle in that corn crib and they began to pray to the Lord and they prayed to the Lord over a period of quite some time and they prayed for understanding they prayed for God's guidance they prayed for his leading and finally they got up from their knees after they had the the assurance in their hearts and they felt the assurance that God would lead them and that he would help them to understanding they didn't get the understanding right then but they felt that assurance that God would lead them when they got back up most of the people went inside the farmhouse but two of the men started across a cornfield they headed across a cornfield to go visit some in another nearby farm to see how they were doing with their disappointment as they went across the cornfield one of those two men a man by the name of Hiram Edson said that for the first time he came to a new understanding saying that we should not have expected Jesus to come to planet earth on October 22 1844 but we should have expected Jesus to come to his father in a heavenly judgment scene on that date because the day of atonement we have discovered the Jews looked upon that as a day of judgment remember how we read from the Jewish encyclopedia about that in fact what we discovered was that in Daniel chapter 8 this cleansing of the sanctuary is the parallel for Daniel chapter 7 and so for Hiram Edson this came flooding across his mind and these Bible verses sprang into his mind right after they had gotten up from praying and asking the Lord to lead them feeling the assurance that God would give them understanding 
In Daniel 7 verse 9, it says, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. And so they focused upon this heavenly judgment scene that we have studied about in the past. In verse 13 it says, I was watching in the night visions and behold one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, not to the earth. Notice, he came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And they noticed how Jesus would come before the Father in this heavenly judgment scene, a pre-advent judgment where he will receive from his Father his kingdom and then he will come back to planet earth to give the kingdom to the saints of the Most High. And so they recognized that this was part of what needed to be accomplished and completed during the time of the end before we get to the end of time. As they began to discover these things, they went back to the prophecies of the book of Daniel and Revelation, and they discovered these important things. First of all, they discovered how the prophecy had actually predicted their experience. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Now, Sometimes when people say, well, those who had part in this certainly could not have been led of God because they were wrong about something, well, they miss the fact that the disciples of Jesus' day were wrong about something. And what did he do with them? Did he give up on them? No, he just helped them to have a greater understanding of his word. And I'd like to suggest that's what the Lord did here with these people concerning this second disappointment as well. But I want you to notice that not only was God leading them, but God actually had predicted that this would happen, that they would have this bitter disappointment. And God doesn't leave them in the disappointment. Notice what he says to those who have the experience in verse 11. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Or as some translations put it, they say, you must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. In other words, those who had part of this experience, who had that sweet and then bitter experience, experience who had the bitter disappointment they had more work to do they had additional work to do to go out and proclaim God's message because before the seventh angel can sound this mystery of God must be finished back in 1843 1844 those who had part of this movement thought they were preaching God's final message for planet earth but as they went back to the prophecies, as they understood that God had other messages of the Bible, they began to discover messages that need to go to the entire world. The messages that we have looked at in the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14. In Revelation 14, verse 6, it says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell where, folks? Who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So it's a worldwide movement, and they're flying in the midst of heaven. It's the everlasting gospel to preach throughout the world. And so they discovered that among God's last day messages, the everlasting gospel needs to be proclaimed throughout the entire world. Oh, and then they focused upon these messages in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. That's what the everlasting gospel has always been about. Why is it important? For the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth the sea and springs of water. And so they noted that part of this everlasting gospel is to put God first in our life, to give glory to Him, and that we are living in God's judgment hour. They discovered that these messages of Revelation chapter 14 are also interlude messages, that these are messages for those who live in the time of the end, and they already being in the time of the end, that God's judgment had already begun. 
And also that we need to be called back to worshiping the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And we've discovered the way we do that is to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And so God's last day messages not only include the everlasting gospel to go throughout the world, but also announcing that God's judgment has come. Calling the world to worship God as creator, restoring the Sabbath to its rightful place. The second angel's message of Revelation 14, verse 8. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And we've discovered that Babylon has fallen because of the false teachings that she spreads throughout the world. And so they noted that there needed to be a warning message proclaimed to the world about fallen Babylon and the false teachings. And also in Revelation 14 verse 9, then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. And so they noted that there is a warning for those who worship the beast or receive the mark of the beast or worship the image of the beast. And so they noted that there needs to be a warning message going throughout the world concerning the beast, the image of the beast, the mark of the beast. And they noticed how in Revelation 14 verse 12 it says, here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and what else, folks? and the faith of Jesus. So they notice that these messages going throughout the entire world are messages that are calling people to a faithful obedience to God's commandments, calling people back to a faith of Jesus, that faith that says, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. A faith of Jesus, that original faith that was delivered to the early Christian church keeping God's commandments, having the faith of Jesus Christ. And in Revelation 12, verse 17, back on Saturday night, we looked at this, where it says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the what, folks? With the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Remember how we learned that God has a church of the remnant and that church of the remnant are identified as those who keep the commandments of God and have the what? The testimony of Jesus Christ. Remember how we learned about the testimony of Jesus Christ? How we discovered the definition for that term in Revelation 19 verse 10 where it says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy or the gift of prophecy. And so we noted these identifying characteristics and we noted that these are God's last day messages that need to go to the entire world. Now, those who had come out of that great disappointment began to discover these messages and began to proclaim them throughout the world. Those who came out of that and recognized that the time was right, but the event predicted was incorrect, and rather than the event being the second coming of Jesus Christ, it was the beginning of a pre-advent heavenly judgment that must be completed before Jesus Christ returns. They recognize that these are messages that God has for the time of the end that will lead us to the end of time. Those people who came to this understanding today are known as Seventh-day Adventists. Now there's something I want to share with you about this. As you look at this list of messages, the everlasting gospel going throughout the world, today the Seventh-day Adventist Church is one of the fastest growing denominations in the world, having already entered the top ten denominations of Christian religions in our world today. And I know that when you come to this particular seminar and you look around here, you think that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a relatively small group. Well, maybe here in the Bible Belt that's true, but it's not true in other parts of the world. In fact, I've mentioned before that if you go to some of the Caribbean islands, you will discover that the Seventh-day Adventist Church in some of those places is the largest Protestant church on, all, on the entire island. In fact, uh, in various places where you go, uh, you can go and you could hear this message in different parts of the world. You didn't have to come here in North America. You could have gone to Mexico, to Central America. You could have gone to South America, Africa, Europe, Asia. 
you could have gone to China and heard these messages. You could have gone to Japan and heard these messages. You could have gone throughout the world. Probably, since you speak English, it's a good thing that you came here, though, isn't it? Could have heard my friend down in Florida, Lester Pratt. You could have heard my colleague Wendell Stover over in Georgia or my nephew Brent Brousset out in Northern California <clears throat> proclaiming these same messages. You know, some of you have marveled about how well you've come to an understanding of God's Word as you've been coming to this seminar hearing me share these things with you. Well, I have a confession to make. I'm not all that good. It's just that I have a great message to share from God's Word. You see, the key is the message. And I want you folks to understand something about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. These messages are the reason why the Seventh-day Adventist Church exists today. Oh, let me help you to understand something. It's because of these messages that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has come into existence. Now, the Lord did not need simply another denomination. Am I right? He didn't need another denomination. There are plenty of denominations in the world, and if you want to be part of a denomination, you know, you can go out and find one, okay? So God didn't really need another denomination. What he wanted was a group of people who would take seriously the truths of God's word, to take seriously the messages of the book of Revelation, to go to proclaim them to the world. You know, I've heard some of you say to me through this series, and I've heard it in other places that I have been time after time, how people will say, well, you know, nobody seems to preach on the prophecies today. Have you ever noticed that? So where do you have to come to hear these messages proclaimed? You have to come to a Seventh-day Adventist church to hear a warning message about the false teachings of fallen Babylon, to hear a warning message about the beast and the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, because even some of those who do preach on prophecy will tell you about the beast and the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. They'll say, don't worry about it. It's not going to take place until after you're out of here anyway. Nothing to worry about. Oh, where do you have to go to hear the message that says that God's judgment has come? Where do you have to go to hear people say, we need to worship God as the Creator. We need to restore His Sabbath to its rightful place. We need to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because the book of Revelation calls God's people to the keeping of God's commandments, to the faith of Jesus, having the testimony of Jesus Christ, that gift of prophecy that He's given to His church. You see, these are identifying marks of God's church of the remnant. And yes, I've been inviting you folks who have been coming to this seminar to consider becoming members of the Adventist church. But when I've been doing that, I want you to understand I'm not just giving you an invitation to become part of another denomination. What I'm doing is I'm giving you an invitation and an opportunity to become part of a group of people who take these messages seriously, to become part of a group of people who proclaim these messages throughout the world. As we close, I want to take you to another angel flying in the midst of heaven. There's lots of angels in the book of Revelation, aren't there? And here's another one. Notice it in Revelation 18, verse 1. It says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice. If you're going to get it throughout the world, you've got to have a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become a habitation of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You see, they've participated in the false teachings. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury what i want you to notice is that there is a warning message here again in revelation chapter 18 warning us about fallen babylon warning us about the false teachings but then notice that there is a voice that speaks from heaven what do we do when a voice from heaven speaks we ought to listen Revelation 18, verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her who? Come out of her my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. What we discover is that there's a voice from heaven 
proclaiming to his people throughout the world, even those who are in fallen Babylon, saying, Come out of her, my people. But when he calls them out of fallen Babylon, where does he call them? Does he call them out into a vacuum? Does he call them out onto their own? No, he calls them, I believe, into his church of the remnant. Notice it says, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. You see, don't continue to participate in those false teachings. Lest you receive of her plagues, because it's clear in the book of Revelation that the seven last plagues come upon those who end up on the side of the beast, in the image of the beast, receiving the mark of the beast. So what we need to do is we need to answer the voice that calls from heaven to come out of fallen Babylon, to leave the false teachings behind, to embrace the truth of God's word and join with others in proclaiming the gospel and finishing the mystery of God so that the seventh angel can sound. That's why the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in existence today. That's why I'm a minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is because it's only in this church that I can proclaim these messages that I have been sharing with you here this evening. It's only in this church that I can share the message about God's Sabbath day, announcing that God's judgment has come, warning about the false teachings of fallen Babylon, warning against the beast and the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, calling people to a faithful obedience to the commandments of God and that faith of Jesus, the teachings that came from the Word of God. Tonight I'd like to invite you to take out the response card that you were given when you came in. And I want you to consider some responses tonight, and some of you have been doing that and have been responding to these messages. You know, as I've been giving the invitation for you to consider becoming a member of this church, I've talked with those of you and I've tried to answer your questions as you've had questions. And some of you have said to me, well, Dale, I want to observe God's Sabbath, but I'm not sure about all of the things that the church teaches. And so we gave you this little booklet in his steps, a summary of the doctrinal beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I hope you take the time to read it. If you haven't read it, read it now. Uh, go through it and see the things that you might have questions on. If there's anything in that little book that you have questions on, don't hesitate to come and ask me that question, whatever question it might be. And then also, a couple of nights ago, I gave you this little yellow sheet that has the commitment that one makes when one becomes a member of the Adventist Church because I don't want you to make a commitment to something that you're not fully informed about. And some of you have already gone through that and filled that out and turned it back in. Others of you can do that tonight. But I want to say this, if you've been with me each night, those of you who have been with me hearing the things that I've been sharing from God's Word, you've been hearing the teachings of the church. And with that little booklet and that little yellow sheet, you have everything in your hand that you need to have in your hand now in order to make an informed decision. So let me encourage you. Get your questions answered. And as you get your questions answered... Make a commitment to following the truths of God's Word. Follow where God is leading you. Tonight on the response card, number one, I want to answer God's call to come out of Babylon. Is that your desire? To answer God's call to come out of Babylon, to leave the false teachings behind? If so, put a check mark in that box next to the number one. Number two, I want to be part of God's last day remnant who keep all His commandments, including the Sabbath command. You know, I... I put that up there because if we're going to keep all of God's commandments we need to remember all ten of them isn't that right you want to be part of that last day remnant faithful to all of God's commandments put a check mark in the box next to the number two and then we've talked about these two last night number three I want to be baptized and number four I want to join the church by profession of faith some of you are already planning to be in the baptismal service coming up this next Sabbath if you want to be in that baptismal service, joining the church through baptism, put a check mark in the box next to the number three. Or if you've already been baptized by immersion and would like to become members of this church, proclaiming these messages to the world through profession of faith, put a check mark in the box next to the number four. Indicate your response to God, to His Holy Spirit. And before we collect these along with our envelopes tonight, let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father in heaven, 
We thank you for what we have learned from your word tonight. We thank you that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, and we thank you that you're sending him again. And we see that in the book of Revelation, there are messages that need to be proclaimed to the world during this time of the end so that the end of time can come, so that the seventh angel can sound, so that Jesus can come and we can be united together with you in your kingdom. Father in heaven, help us each one to follow the leading of your Holy Spirit. When we hear the voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, help us to answer that voice. Help us to hear the voice of Jesus and help us to follow where he leads, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.